Hello everyone, this is Klaus Araya for, uh, for the University of Tsukuba and this is Experiment Designs for Computer Science uh, Week 8 uh, and we're going to talk about experiment power and sample size. I'd like to start by apologizing for this late lecture. Uh, this particular lecture was supposed to come last Friday but I had a problem with recording. Um, and I also would like to remind everyone of the dates for this um, for the end of the course. So this will be the last video lecture. Okay, so we're going to talk about sample size calculator, and this will close uh, the video lectures for this course for this semester. This Friday, July third, we're going to have our second Q and A session. It will be in the same format as the first Q and A session. I will write the details about the online meeting at the Manaba for this course. Finally, um, as I mentioned in the last video lecture, we had a large extension for grading. So the deadline for the report three has been extended to July 20th. So you still have 20 days from this lecture uh, to work on report three. And uh, if you remember from the last video lecture, the report three will be a report on an experiment that uh, you perform. Uh, and this, exper this experiment must include in the experiment design, comparison of multiple samples and uh, sample size calculation. Okay, if you have any questions about how to design your experiment, if you have a, 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 an experimental proposal, but you're not sure if it, uh, if it meets all the requirements for report number three, please do not hesitate to contact me by email or just send a message to um, Manaba um, asking more questions about this report. All right. So let's move into the lecture. So the outline for the lecture today, uh, the topic is the calculation of sample sizes. We're gonna do a very quick review of type two error and approaches for choosing uh, sample sizes. And then we're gonna spend most of our time uh, talking about sample size calculation for different tasks. So we studied several tasks in this lecture like the single sample test and comparisons of just samples, paired comparison, equality testing, and ANOVA. And we'll talk about how we select samples for each of these cases. So what is a sample size calculation? So during this course, we introduced several kinds of statistical tests. So you have one sample, or maybe you have two samples that you obtain during an experiment, and you want to determine uh, some uh, inference hypothesis based on the, the samples, or maybe you just want to calculate a uh, confidence interval, or you want to calculate some estimator for the population from where the samples came, okay? Uh, in all these calculations, in all these statistics, there is an assumption that you have um, a large number of observations for your sample, okay? Why do you need uh, these observations? Well, by obtaining more observations, we can increase the precision of the point estimators that we are using to estimate the population parameter. Especially, for instance, in the case of par um, interval estimators, such as the confidence interval, um, a, larger number of rep a, lar a larger number of observations will usually lead to a smaller um, region of the confidence interval will give us a better idea of what is the max what are, what are the uh, reasonable values for estimate for the parameter being estimated okay uh, also we saw that increasing the number of observations can be used to increase the confidence or the power of a test so we saw that uh, the calculation of alpha the power of a test is um, the, is the, 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 the power of a test depends on the, on the number of observations, as well as the confidence of a test also depends on the number of observations. Beta, the power of a test, or alpha, the confidence of a test, is related to the number of observations. 
Also, when we have a large number of observations in our experiment, it's easier to, for us to find um, outliers and special situations. Like if you only collect a, a very small number of samples, you might not have the chance to observe some, some unique cases of your experiment. Um, so all of these are good reasons uh, to take multiple observations when conducting an experiment. But this leads, this leaves the question, okay, so we need a lot of repetitions, but how many repetitions do you need? How many observations is necessary for our experiment? Okay, one simple answer, and that is, of course, it's a simple and not correct answer, is that the more the merrier, just Let's try to get the biggest n that we can. Let's try to, let's get the largest number of observations that we can, okay? But there are some problems with uh, if the number of observations is very large. The first one is a numerical problem. If you remember our lecture on hypothesis testing, uh, I showed to you that it's possible to reduce p arbitrarily by increasing the value of n. And this is especially worrisome in computational experiments because in computational experiments, you can reproduce your experiments very easily. So you can execute an experiment maybe one million times or two million times. And by reproducing the experiment two million times, you're gonna have a very, very small confidence interval, a very, very small p-value that does not really indicate uh, what is the actual difference that you are observing in the experiment. And some of you saw this in your experiments, like you had this tiny difference between two, two distributions. And you could, sh by sampling from these two distributions a million time, times, you could show that this tiny difference was significantly, uh, was statistically significant. And that leads to the second question. Okay, it's statistically significant, but is it relevant? It's, it, it is a, a meaningful difference, okay? So sometimes just having a very large sample size does not help us answer the questions that we are really interested in answering in our experiment. Also, um, when we go a little bit away from computer experiments, um, the cost of taking, uh, uh, doing a lot of observations can be uh, very high. So if, if our experiments depends on people or if our experiments depends on producing physical items, if our experiments depends on some sort of resource, it may not be possible for us to have a very light, large number of rep uh, rep uh, repetitions. Even if our experiment is completely digital, if it's completely on top of a computer, but even in this case, it might take some calculation time. Um, it might take uh, costs in terms of you have to pay to access uh, your supercomputer or something like that. So you might be limited on the number of experiments that you can do. So you cannot have an arbitrarily large experiment. Finally, uh, the number of observations that you have available will influence your data uh, preparation step. So before you do the data analysis, you might have to transform your data, or you might have to maybe treat outliers. Uh, you might have different choices of uh, a, a, a statistical and statistical tests that depends on how much data you actually have. So because of these codependencies, it's interesting that you know you just, I mean, instead of just, okay, let's just get as many observations as we want, you want to calculate the number of observations that you execute in your experiment. So you can use this number to make several other decisions about data preparation, test selection, etc. So it's, it's good to calculate in advance uh, the number of observations in your experiment. Okay, so because of these reasons, we are interested in having a formal way to calculate the number of observations. Okay, so how do we do that? Some of you 
might have already started to read papers in the literature. Maybe you have read papers for your research, or maybe you saw the experiments done by uh, older other people in the laboratory, and you have come across this. Let's the re experiment was repeated thirty times. This magic number. Lots of experiments, they do the, lots of papers, lots of experiments, they use this magic number. Let's repeat the number of experiments 30 times. Sometimes 20, sometimes 40, but it's like a number that comes out of nowhere. It's a very nice round number. Where does this number come from? Okay, why repeat the experiment 30 times and why is that not a good idea all of the time? So the 30 times comes from the central limit theorem. Do you remember the central limit theorem? We talked about the CLT in the second lecture when we were talking about uh, confidence interval. So the CLT is that idea that if you have a process that has a distribution, okay, and you calculate some statistic on a sample of that, that process. For instance, you calculate the mean based on a sample of size five. Now, the observations have a sample, but the mean calculated from samples also has a distribution. So the observation has a distribution and the mean estimator also has a distribution. And the distribution of the mean estimator that is made from a sample, well, the CLT says that the larger the sample size, the closer this mean estimator distribution will be to a normal, okay? So to put it more formally, the CLT states that the distribution of sample means tends to follow a normal distribution. And this effect, it can be observed even on means of very small samples. For instance, if you're taking um, one number that follows a uniform, uniform distribution, okay? So it's a random variable from a computer. It goes from zero to one with equal probability for all values. This is a uniform distribution. If you take a sample from this uniform distribution, like you take five values of from this uniform distribution and you calculate the mean, the distribution of the, this mean estimator will be very, very close to normal. Okay, so the idea is that if we take samples from well-behaved distributions, these samples will follow, uh, 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 statistics on these samples will follow uh, normal distribution with very small sample sizes. Now, however, in general, when you have less well-behaved distributions, distributions with large bias or distributions that very, very far away from normal, the CLT will still hold for n that is uh, around 30, except in cases that are very extreme. So this 30 times comes from this result that in general, if the CLT will hold, you will observe the CLT holding for n around 30, okay? Um, so that's where the 30 comes from. You put 30 and you can kind of ignore the, the the, 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 the distribution of your population, you know that the CLT will make the distribution of your sample follow a normality, okay? Now, uh, why this? Because many statistical tasks require the normality distributions. You saw in this lecture, more than half of the statistical tests that we described require the, the, the assumption of normality or the assumption of a normal distribution. So people developing this test, and especially people using these tests, they required an n equal to 30 to guarantee that in not, if you, if, if you don't have a lot of information about the underlying distribution of your data, you can kind of expect the CLT to do its job and give you a normal distribution for your estimator, okay? Does this mean that we have to use this 30? Okay, well, there are some cases that 30 is not the right value, okay? For example, if the underlying distribution of the population is very well behaved, and I gave you the example of your population following a uh, uniform distribution, okay? In that case, you don't need 30. You can get the normal T assumption 
from a much lower value, okay? Uh, also, if you're doing a statistical test that does not require the underlying distribution to be normal, then there is no really reason the, the rule of thumb of 30 repetitions also does not apply here because 30 is to guarantee that the CLT will work. So this reason is not, is not meaningful anymore if you're not assuming, assuming normality of your data, okay? Uh, another situation where the rule of thumb of 30 is not very appropriate is when you're comparing two samples and the two different samples, they have different, uh, very different uh, variance, not variance, variance, uh, typo here. Okay, typo, yeah. Okay, so if you have two samples and they have very different variances, the, it, it's kind of, uh, we're gonna talk about this later, but the idea is that the sample that has a higher variance requires more uh, observations that the sample that has a smaller variance. So you can have less samples, less observations here and more observations here, okay? Uh, a different case is that your experimental budget simply does not allow, you cannot do 30 experiments. So if you do not have enough money to do 30 experiments, what do you do? Or even if it's not a budget, but for instance, let's say that you are doing some sort of drug test or you're doing some sort of test that require cooperation from humans and you want to minimize that. You want to have as few people as possible. So in that case, you don't want to use this rule of thumb. You want to explicitly calculate the minimal number of observations that you require for your experimental assumptions, okay? So all of these are strong reasons to do an explicit calculation of sample size and not just use 30, okay? Okay, so let's talk about this last case. What happens if you don't have enough money and you say, look, uh, it doesn't matter what I calculate, I can only run five experiments. Okay, if you only have money for five experiments, what do you do? Okay, even in the case where your budget constrain the number of experiments that you can do, you know, the number of observations that you can have, it's still good to calculate the number of observations. And why is that? It's because the number, the, the calculations for sample size are very closely related to the calculations of power. If your number of, if your number of observations is constrained, you want to calculate the power of your experiment given that the, that number of observations. So you know if your experiment is uh, um, if your experiment is sensitive or not, okay? So the power of an experiment is an expression of the probability of type two errors, false negatives. In other words, if your experiment has low power, if it's a low powered experiment, there's a very high chance that you will not be able to find the effect that you are trying to find, even if the effect exists. Let's say that you generate a new drug that can cure a certain disease. If you do not test it on enough people, you might not be able to obtain enough information to show statistically that your drug has the desired attributes, okay? That's because your experiment is not powerful enough. Uh, your experiment is not, uh, your experiment is not powerful enough, okay? So if your experiment is constrained by budget, we want to do a power analysis to see how much of, uh, how sensitive it is, how much of an effect I can expect to detect with an experiment with that budget. If the sensitiveness is not enough, then I might want to see that, maybe talk to your, to, to your, to your institution to see if you get a bigger budget, or maybe you have to rethink your experiment, rethink your analysis, go back to the drawing board and see what kind of science you can do with your limited budget, okay? So let's talk about uh, more about sample size and type two error, okay? So given a certain statistical test, the power of the test is a, essentially a function of four elements, okay? The size of the difference, in other words, the amount, the size of the effect 
that we are trying to observe. And remember from lecture number three that the minimum effect is the difference that we are trying to observe. For example, let's say that we are comparing two algorithms for their speed. The size of the difference is the minimum, the, the minimum amount of time difference that we are interested. Maybe we don't care if algorithm A is 0.01 second is one millis if algorithm A is one millisecond faster than algorithm B, we don't care for some reason. But if algorithm A is one second faster than algorithm B, then that's important. So in this case, the minimum effect that we are interested in is one second. Okay. Now the second uh, the second thing that we are interested in is the variability of the observations. So the bigger the variance, uh, the larger the probability of a type two error. Okay, the significance level, the value of alpha, is one parameter that we choose when we define the experiment, and it also influences the power of the experiment. Experiments with a higher significance level will have lower power. They will have a lower ability to detect. Uh, attributes of that significance. Finally, a uh, sample size is uh, another factor that influences the power of the, the experiment. Bigger sample size implies a bigger power for our experiment. In general, we don't control these first two. Like the size of the difference is the difference that exists. If there is no difference, then we cannot detect anything. If the difference is too small, we cannot detect it. Or if the difference is too big, then it's easy to detect with a not very high power test. Uh, the variability of observations is also the reality. We cannot control it. Uh, we can indirectly reduce the variability of the observations by increasing the sample size. And we can reduce the significance level uh, as a trade-off with the power of the test. So to estimate, so the idea to estimate the power, the minimum power of the test is to define the minimal interesting effect delta. So this delta, so if we go back, the actual size of the difference is the real difference between the, the, what we are, the, the new hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. The actual size of the difference is the real difference between the two algorithms that we are comparing. But we need, we can define, we cannot control the real difference. The real difference is the real difference. It exists. But we can control the minimal interesting effect, the minimal interesting difference. The difference that we can, we can control this threshold that we say, a difference under this threshold, it's not important enough for us. A difference above this threshold is important for us. So we can define that. Okay. Now, how do we define that? The minimal difference depends on the scientific knowledge about the phenomenon. So if it's a completely theoretical experiment, uh, a completely theoretical research, uh, it might depend on the bibliography. If it's, an experiment, uh, if it's a research based on some practical application, you have to talk to the engineer or to the social scientist or to the historian that you are talking to in this experiment to define what is the minimal interesting effect, okay? So you need a good understanding of the, exp of the uh, field where the experiment will be conducted to know what is this minimal uh, interesting effect. After we define the minimal interesting effect, we can ob obtain an est we need to obtain an estimate of the variance of the observations. Now there are many different ways to obtain the to estimate this variance. We can also obtain the variance from uh, domain knowledge. So if it's, for instance, an analysis of a machine of a factory, maybe the engineer that designed the machine, maybe they know what is the what is the variance for that process. Or if it is a historical process, we can look at historical data to estimate the variance. If it is a future process, we can try to do a pilot study to try to obtain this variance. <clears throat> so there are different ways. Okay. So after we have 
an estimation of the variance and after we have a value for the minimum interesting effect, we can uh, run the calculate the type two error and by knowing the power of the experiment, the probability of type two error, we can run the experiment with a better understanding of how, what is the ability of this experiment of detecting the uh, effect of interest. A test with lower, a test, uh, even when we have a power for a given difference alpha, this means that dif delta, it means that differences smaller than delta can still happen, but they might not be detected by this experiment. And differences bigger than delta, they will be detected more easily by this experiment. So this may give us some information about what do we do if our, um, what do we do if our um, test is, uh, does not return a statistically significant result? The meaningful, the, the, uh, how meaningful is a, a, a rejection or a known rejection of the new hypothesis depends on the power of the test that we are executing. Now let's see a concrete example. Imagine that we have one, one experiment uh, where we take one sample and we compare it against a fixed value. So here, the new hypothesis is that the mean, the mean of the sample is below a certain value, and the alternate hypothesis is that the mean of the sample is not below the certain value. Now, for this experiment, we have a fixed sample size of 10, and we determined that the minimal value, the minimal effect of significance is 0 0.5. So we are only interested if the difference between our sample and this value is of at least 0 0.5 versus 0 0.5 seconds or 0 0.5 kilos. It depends on our experiment. We have an estimate for the standard deviation of, out of one, sigma equals to one, and our desired significance is alpha 0 0.01. So until now, if you did an experiment, this would be the attributes that you would select. You would select a sample size, maybe arbitrarily, maybe depending on some sort of limit. Uh, we would define a significance. We want 99% of confidence. So our significance alpha is 0 0.01. We have an estimate for our standard deviation and we have our minimal value of interest, 0 0.5. Given these values, how do we calculate the power of this experiment? Well, usually we uh, are as well as Excel, as well as SPSS and other softwares with statistical capability, they will have power calculation tools. So in R, if we're, our experiment is a t-test, we can calculate the power of the t-test with the power t-test function, and we give information about our experiment. We have a number, a num a number of observations equals to 10, the delta equal to 0 0.5, standard deviation one, significance level 0, 0, 001. Okay, these are our attributes. We're doing a one sample experiment with the alternative hypothesis being one-sided. In other words, we are interested if our method has a mean under uh, the new hypothesis value, under zero, and not, <clears throat> uh, and not different, yeah, just under. So in these cases, uh, we get this information. So notice that here we do not run the experiment yet. The actual value of the experiment is not necessary for the calculation of power. We just need to know the parameters for the experiment design. So the power calculation and the sample calculation, they all happen before the experiment at the experiment design stage, okay? So we have the number of observations is 10, delta 0, 5, and here we have our power. Our power is 0 0.16, okay? Our beta is 0 0.16. So this is a very low power, okay? Uh, we have one minus this is the probability of um, type two errors if the, dif the real difference is 0 0.5 or less. So if the real difference between the, if the real difference between the sample and the target value is 0 0.5, we have an almost 85% chance of having a false negative. Okay, so this is a very low-powered experiment. 
we have a very high chance of not being able to detect uh, the real difference, uh, the, the difference of 0 0.5 between our data and the target value. So what if, so what, how many, so we have a low power experiment. Let's say that we can increase the number of observations. We want to know how, how many observations we need to have an experiment of power 85, to have a, a, a 0 0.85 powered experiment, beta equals 0, 0 0.85. So we can use the same, uh, the same function, but instead of specifying n, we're gonna specify the power. So we say we want the power to be 0 0.85, but we don't give n as one of the parameters. So again, it will calculate, <clears throat> we'll do the power, the power calculation for the test, and n here will be 447.98. Uh, usually we round this value up, so this, uh, this is the minimum n for to have the desired power, but because we cannot do 47.9 experiments, we round this up, we get 48 experiments, okay? So we need 48 observations in our sample to detect a one-sided deviation of 0 0.5 or more uh, on, the mean, <coughs> on the mean with a power level of 0 0.85, okay? So this would be a very simple case of a one sample uh, experiment. And, <coughs> But let's consider a more standard uh, case where we are comparing two means. We are comparing the means from two samples, okay? Uh, well, it has been about 30 minutes for this video. So in the next video, we will look at these more specific examples. So see you uh, there.